This program is brought to you by the National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors, promoting political advocacy, education, and the ethical conduct of its more than 50,000 members nationwide. Hello. Welcome to another edition of NAFA's Program in a Box. My name is Bob Arst, president and founder of Polaris One and insurancecoachu.com. I work with financial advisors and managers and management teams in helping them achieve all that they're capable of in their practices. Thank you for watching this Program in a Box. It's my goal to provide you with at least an idea or two that will inspire you enough to actually write it down and implement it within the next 24 hours. The program today is based on my book, What Every Great Salesperson Knows, a no-nonsense guide to sales success. It contains practical self-assessments, effective exercises, and actual case studies from my coaching practice. The assessment measures where you score on 15 sales success factors. More on those sales success factors later in the program. To get started, I'd like to first briefly discuss the four traits of highly effective salespeople. They are strong goal clarity, high achievement drive, healthy emotional intelligence, and excellent social skills. When I survey advisors at my courses and presentations, the one trait they consistently score themselves the lowest in is goal clarity. Without crystal clear goal clarity, you're subject to distractions. Distractions cause a loss of focus, which in turn drains both your energy and your effectiveness. Let me give you an example. When you're distracted and feel that loss of focus, it doesn't feel good. You may get a knot in your stomach or even feel ill. In order to feel better in today's multitasking world, you might create to-do lists. If you're really good, you might even prioritize your list. Then you say to yourself, I've got 10 free minutes right now. I'll tackle item number 10 on my list. You complete the task, check it off your list, you feel good for accomplishing something. But let me ask you this. Was the item you checked off an A, B, or C priority? Most likely it was a C priority. In fact, at the end of the day, or the week, or the month, we find that too many C priority items are completed, not many B-level items, and a real scarcity of A-level priority items. So what exactly is goal clarity? Goal clarity is having clear, specific, written goals of what you want to have happen in your future. What you deeply desire, what you want to achieve, your belief in that they are possible for you to achieve, and you are worthy to achieve them. Let me share a story with you about a previous coaching client We'll call him Fred. Fred's manager thought he should shoot for his company's top club. Fred thought it was a good idea as well, so he agreed to it. However, it was only an intellectual decision to achieve that goal. He really didn't believe that it was possible for him to produce at that level. It was therefore not even a stretch goal. In fact, agreeing to that goal had just the opposite effect. Fred got more and more discouraged because he wasn't even coming close to hitting his targets. In working with Fred, we eliminated those goals that were merely, it would be nice to achieve, and replaced them with more meaningful ones. Now, Fred didn't hit his manager's goal, but he did achieve a significant increase over his previous year's production and felt much better about himself. The next trait is high achievement drive. The good news is that you already possess all of the achievement drive that you need to reach your goals if 
the following conditions are met. Your goals are crystal clear, you're absolutely passionate about achieving them, and you believe that they are possible for you to achieve. The intensity you feel about these factors determines exactly how much achievement drive is released within you. Well, let me give you an example. Can you think of a time when you achieved a great goal, yet had to overcome many obstacles to do so? You didn't let anything get in your way. In fact, you were energized in the pursuit of that goal. Now think of a time when you achieved another goal, yet it felt as if you were walking through molasses to get there. In this later example, less achievement drive was released towards the attainment of that goal. As you could see from this slide, healthy emotional intelligence is defined as the ability to understand your emotions and the impact that they have on you and your behaviors and on others. Salespeople with healthy emotional intelligence are better able to cope with negative emotions, resistance to change, and other success killers. There's a wonderful book by Paul Stoltz titled The Adversity Quotient. He describes three types of people who are faced with the challenge of climbing a very steep mountain. This same analogy applies to achieving goals. The first type of person is the quitter. They feel that the challenge is just too difficult for them to even attempt trying it. The second type of person is the camper. They start out on the climb, but get tired along the way and need to stop and rest. The problem is they just get way too comfortable and decide to just stay where they are. The third type of person is the climber. Climbers do camp from time to time but it is to rest, regain focus, and to recharge. Climbers are resilient and continuously set new goals and desire to climb even more mountains. The next and final trait of highly successful salespeople is that they possess excellent social skills. This is not the gift of gab. It is the ability to be an excellent communicator the ability to communicate with others in the style that they are accustomed to and prefer. In the NAFA sales system course, we say that there are four types of behavior styles. They are the talker, doer, controller, and supporter. We teach that it is important to know what your own style is and the style of your prospect or client. The more you are able to communicate in the style your prospect is most comfortable with, the better the relationship you will develop and the easier it will be to communicate. The next two social skills are the ability to ask great questions and the ability to be a great listener. These need no further explanation. However, I would like to say that most advisors admit there is much room for improvement around listening skills. Let's move on to those sales success factors I mentioned earlier. The 15 sales success factors are based on over 20 years of study by researchers looking to discover the measurable personal characteristics that make the difference between top sales performers and just average ones. We broke them down into four clusters. They are mastery of self, mastery of the sales process, mastery of customer relationships, and mastery of own business. The first cluster is mastery of self. Mastery of self cluster contains four sales success factors. They are show self-discipline, has self-confidence, maintains self-control, and assesses self accurately. For this program, I've selected one sales success factor from each cluster to talk about. In the Mastery of Self cluster, I selected self-discipline. Mastering this sales success factor will yield a very high return on every way. The key factors are organization and time management. I'm a big believer in time blocking. More on that in a minute. 
I like to ask the question, what is the highest and best use of your time? This is a question that you should continually ask yourself. Now we have this funny formula here. I plus E in brackets times F equals XR. The XR stands for extraordinary results. Here's what the formula means. The I is for information or ideas. The E is the execution of those ideas. I plus E get added together. They then get multiplied by F. F is for focus. Focus is the multiplier. Make a commitment to work in a distraction-free zone. It all starts with goal clarity, as we mentioned earlier. Let me share another case study with you. Barbara was an advisor I work with who really needed help with this sales success factor. Her days were scattered, jumping from one distraction to the next. She worked hard to apply some of the following tactics and was able to add many more highly productive hours to her week and ultimately increased her sales by 25%. Let me walk you through it. Like Barbara, the request I get most often from my coaching clients is to help them with their time management. I first ask them to analyze where they are currently spending their time. I suggest that they review their calendar for the last month or two and to write down all of the categories where they spend their time and then to calculate the amount of time or the percentage of time that they spend in each category. I next ask them to create a pie chart that shows the breakdown. A hand-drawn pie chart works just as well as a computer-generated one. As you could see from this slide, some of the key time blocks as shown on the graph as percentages are miscellaneous, 34%, administration, 20%, appointment, 17%, and telephoning, 3%. Here's what it looks like on a pie chart. Next, I ask them to use the same categories, but to create an ideal use of their time. In this case, the breakdown of those same categories is as follows. Miscellaneous 5%, administration 7%, appointments 26%, and telephoning 8%. Here's what that looks like on a pie chart. Now we can compare the current and the ideal view side by side. They look quite different, don't they? The ideal use of their time is on the left and the current on the right. We can now begin to work on the action plans that will move them closer and closer to the ideal plan. It's more than just reapportioning time. We oftentimes must problem solve around what is the root cause of the problem and solve that first before we can move on to the next step, which is to create what I call the ideal work week. Here's an example of one. Now, let me stress that we're not suggesting that this will work for you. It's different for each person. Also remember that it's called the ideal work week. It's something to shoot for. And we could only come close to attaining the ideal. The key points in this ideal work week are as follows. Administration, there's about four hours. Case prep, three hours. Training and professional development, four hours. And the all-important fail-safe catch-up time, about 12 hours. Appointments, 16 hours or 16 time slots. And health, about four hours. Divide up the time in what works best for you. Remember. Be ruthless with your time and time management. If you have scheduled case prep time on Monday from 5 to 6 p.m., treat it just the same as you would an appointment with a client who's coming into your office to make a big purchase. Similarly, if on Tuesday you've blocked off from 10.30 to 11.30 a.m. and from 12 to 1 p.m. for appointments, if a prospect tells you they could see you at 11 a.m., you must tell them no. The reason for that is that you would be trading two appointment slots for one appointment. Might not sound like a big deal, but you could lose up to 25% of your weekly appointments by doing so. 
The next cluster is mastery of the sales process. This cluster consists of the following four sales success factors. Has a results orientation, is adaptable, questions and listens effectively, and applies targeted problem solving. I've selected questions and listens effectively for this program because it impacts almost every other factor. Salespeople who lack this sales success factor come away from fact-finding interviews not knowing what their prospects' key needs, objectives, and available resources are. They oftentimes waste time with prospects who are not qualified. These folks oftentimes have trouble closing. Do any of these sound familiar to you? So, what can you do about it? I'd like to tell you about Stephen. Stephen is someone I'm working with who needs help in this area. He was always surprised by the objections he got during the closing interview. He simply was not prepared for them and never had an effective response. Here are some suggestions on how to become a more effective listener. First on the list is to be prepared. We believe in doing pre-call planning and preparation. Have a track to run on. Winging it is for amateurs. Prepare relevant, and I stress relevant questions in advance. When asking questions and listening to your clients' responses, and navigate with curiosity. Remember, you're not conducting an interrogation. If this is a second or third appointment, anticipate any objections you might get and have well thought out responses at the ready. Here are the other tips. Don't assume anything. When in doubt, ask for clarification. Listen to understand. One way to actively listen is to paraphrase back to your prospect what you heard or think you heard. Take notes. This is another aspect to actively listening. It keeps you focused and shows that you care. Get into alignment. Put yourself into their shoes. See the world from their perspective. Look them in the eye. This is another aspect of active listening. Studies show that people feel you are more engaged with them when you do this. Keep your cool. You're the professional in the relationship. Don't let your ego win the battle, but lose the war. The next cluster is mastery of customer relationships. It consists of three sales success factors. Focuses on customer success, has interpersonal sensitivity, and gains commitment. Let's explore focuses on customer success. Salespeople who lack this sales success factor put themselves in an adversarial relationship with their customers. As mentioned earlier, always needing to win arguments or be proven right is very detrimental to long-term sales success. Push products that don't meet customers' needs. This is caused by the lack of effective fact-finding or listening or making assumptions without checking for understanding. It speaks volumes to clients and prospects that you are a product seller and not a customer-focused, needs-based, trusted advisor. Don't keep in touch once the sale is made. Keep your promise of service. We suggest that you attempt to personally keep in touch twice per year. Believe me when I tell you that it'll set you apart from everyone else. Here are some additional suggestions. Immersing yourself in the client's goals, needs, and objectives. This will help you become that trusted advisor all salespeople strive to become. How can you help your client succeed in his or her business? It's not just how your products and solutions can help them. That's required. Helping them to succeed or do better in their business is providing that value-added service that will also set you apart from your competition. Become an article clipper. It shows you care and will help deepen the relationship you have with your client. Actively listen for ideas during sales meetings or seminars that could benefit specific clients. Try doing this. Let's say you're away at a seminar and hear an idea that one or more of your clients could benefit from. Pick up the phone. Call them, 
say something like this. I'm out of town attending a seminar and learned of an idea and immediately thought of you and how you might benefit from it. Can we set up a time next Tuesday or Thursday for me to review it with you? Who wouldn't be flattered and impressed by your thoughtfulness and would most likely say yes? The final cluster is mastery of own business. It consists of these four sales success factors. Has entrepreneurial drive, uses key information effectively, increases customer value, and builds a team. I've selected builds a team to review. Another very common request for help that I get from my coaching clients is to help them with staff management. Salespeople who lack this success factor would rather do it themselves than delegate, don't communicate effectively to staff, and can't hold others accountable. Here are some ways to improve in this sales success factors. Give others a chance to grow. See more in them than they see in themselves. Did anyone do this for you in your life? If so, pass it on to somebody else. You'll be very surprised at the results. Delegate effectively. Don't do a dump and run or expect staff to be mind readers about what you want done and by when or even how you expect them to do it. Be clear. Clearly define their most important objectives, MIOs for short, and their expectations, standards, and sources, or ESSs. Each MIO has one or more expectations tied to it. The expectation describes the what needs to happen or be accomplished. The standard clearly defines and describes how the expectation is to be accomplished. The standards should be written, specific, and measurable. They don't take anything for granted. The source is the proof. How will you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the expectation was accomplished according to the standards. Once that's done, you need to meet regularly to review the most important objectives. Depending on the task and the person, you may need to meet daily initially, and then perhaps weekly or monthly. In the beginning, it's better to err meeting more often than less often. Expect positive results. If you have any doubts that the person cannot accomplish what you're asking them to do, your attitude will be communicated to them and the end result will end up being a self-fulfilling prophecy. Show thanks and appreciation. Everyone needs support, encouragement, and a pat on the back for a job well done. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today. Let me close by stating the six critical prerequisites to achieving success in sales. They are an unwavering commitment to a sales career mission that it is in line with your personal values. Success in sales requires much more than the application of mechanical techniques. It demands a deep inner belief that you are part of something bigger than yourself and that you are contributing something of great value. A vision that provides a detailed mental picture of the future you want to create for your sales career as you pursue your mission. Walt Disney is often quoted as saying, if you can dream it, you can do it. I agree with him. Clearly define goals in which you specify what you need to achieve to make your vision a reality. Mastery of these sales success factors and the behaviors, motives, attitudes, traits, and self-concepts that contribute to superior sales performance. Mastery comes with practice, dedication to lifelong learning, and a drive for continuous improvement. Just being good enough or possessing average skills won't cut it in today's super competitive, ever-changing marketplace. The sales profession demands excellence. Settle for nothing less. Action plans that provide roadmaps. Vision and mission statements are the what, while action plans are the how. Your action plans don't need to be long or elaborate. Simple bullet points will do. Whatever form they take, 
be sure that they include actionable, measurable steps, each of which has a target deadline date. And finally, a way to maintain progress on your journey until your vision of success becomes a reality. It's imperative that you find a way to keep score. Anything that gets measured can be improved. Tracking your progress along the way is critical to reaching your destination with a minimum of wrong turns and a maximum efficiency and effectiveness. Well, thank you for taking the time to invest in yourself and your practice by viewing this program in a box. I would like to make available to NAFA members a free PDF of my book, What Every Great Salesperson Knows, A No-Nonsense Guide to Sales Success, upon which this program was based. Just go to www.insurancecoachu.com forward slash free book to sign up. For those of you who are serious about looking into starting a coaching relationship, I'd like to offer you a free 45-minute coaching session. Just go to my website, www.insurancecoachu.com, to sign up. Thanks again for watching, and good luck to you on your journey to success. Hello, and welcome to part two of this NAFA program in a box titled Key Success Factors of Great Salespeople and How to Achieve Them. My name is Bob Arst, President and Founder of Polaris One and InsuranceCoachU.com. I help sales professionals to grow their practices and achieve all that they're capable of achieving. This program in a box is based upon my book, What Every Great Salesperson Knows, a no-nonsense guide to sales success. For those of you who know me, you know that I like to use inspirational quotes, and I'd like to start this program with two such quotes. The first one is this. It's true that change is inevitable, but growth, however, is optional. Growth is a conscious decision that you need to make. Not everyone is comfortable with making that decision, but by choosing growth, you oftentimes need to get outside of your comfort zones. But when you do, good things happen, regardless of their outcome. The second quote is this. It's taken from a 1940 speech given at what was then a NALU convention by Albert E. N. Gray. He said that successful people do the things that unsuccessful people don't do. He also said that successful people have the desire for pleasing results, whereas the unsuccessful people have the desire for pleasing methods. Now, he didn't say that the successful people necessarily enjoy doing those things. It's just that they make the commitment to doing them. What follows in today's program are some of those key success factors that all successful producers possess and some suggestions on how you could achieve them. If you're serious about improving yourself and your practice, you'll need to take action. This may involve getting outside of your comfort zone. And my advice to you is to create a simple activity plan of action on how you will apply some of what you hear on today's call, and then to making the commitment to have the discipline to carry out your plan. Let's briefly review some key points from part one. I covered these four traits of highly effective salespeople in part one, and they are strong goal clarity, high achievement drive, healthy emotional intelligence, and excellent social skills. I made the comment that during my courses and programs, the one trait that most advisors rate themselves the lowest in is goal clarity. Without goal clarity, you're subject to distractions, and distractions lead to a loss of focus, which in turn leads to unproductive days. Kind of works like this. You get that uncomfortable feeling in your gut that says, I'm not really accomplishing what I should. You then create one or more to-do lists. And if you're really good, you might even prioritize your list. In our multitasking world, you say to yourself, you know, I've got about 10 minutes right now. 
I could check off item eight on my list. So you do it and it feels good. But at the end of the day or the week or the month or the quarter, you've checked off far too many C priority items, not many Bs, and a real total scarcity of As. My suggestion is to set crystal clear goals for yourself and all of the steps that are necessary to successfully achieve them. Then hold yourself accountable by taking action every day toward the achievement of those goals. In my book, I identified 15 sales success factors that are broken down into four clusters. These sales success factors are based on 20 years of research on highly successful salespeople. During part one, I selected the following four sales success factors, one from each cluster. They were self-discipline, which is making the commitment to doing the right activities on a consistent basis. Questions and listens effectively. As I'm sure many of you have heard, the sale is made during the fact-finding process. And if the truth be known, we really listen people into buying. We don't talk them into buying. Focuses on customer success. The more you do this, the more you become that trusted advisor everyone strives to become. And lastly, builds a team. Learn how to delegate effectively and hold others accountable for the results that have been agreed upon. You can access the first program on NAFA's website by clicking on the member benefits link and then go to the speaker center. Here are the four clusters that encompass the 15 sales success factors. They are mastery of self, mastery of the sales process, mastery of customer relationships, and mastery of own business. For today's program, like last time, I've selected one sales success factor from each cluster. The four success factors in the mastery of self cluster include show self-discipline, has confidence, maintains self-control, and assesses self accurately. In this first cluster, mastery of self, I've selected the sales success factor of self-confidence. Salespeople who lack this sales success factor give up easily in the face of disagreement or rejection. They often make just one closing attempt and then throw in the towel. They experience core reluctance. This takes many forms, but the bottom line is that there is always a great excuse for not putting in the required amount of time to make contact with prospects. This includes not only phone time, but face-to-face -face interaction as well, as in networking. They blame others for their problems. Of course it's not my fault. If only, well, you fill in the blank. They avoid risks. People who lack self-confidence see almost everything they do as risky. They're reluctant to try new ideas due to fear of failure. Failure is a very emotionally charged word, especially in this country. I like to frame it another way and suggest that you might consider doing the same. I'd like to give you an example that comes from my work as a volunteer at the National Air and Space Museum. I give tours at the museum and I like to tell visitors about the Apollo program to the moon and when we landed there in 1969. Kind of works like this. The rocket goes up into space and when it gets in the outside of the atmosphere, the components come apart, they rendezvous and dock, and they begin their journey to the moon. At that point, we send a radar beam off of the moon, which is about 240,000 miles away. The radar beam comes back and gives us a signal. It says, you are failing. You are off course. If you stay on this trajectory, you will miss the moon by hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles. So what do we do? We make a course correction. We fire some retro rockets and some thrusters, and we get back on course. We send another radar beam off of the moon. Beam comes back, and it says, you're still failing. You're getting better, but you're still going to miss the moon. And we do this course correction process continuously until eventually, in July of 1969, we landed on the moon. 
So don't think of it as failure, but simply as the need to make a course correction. Here are some additional suggestions on how you could develop more self-confidence. Commit to an action. Do it, and then evaluate it. Make adjustments or those course corrections we talked about, and then start the process all over again. Pre-call, post-call, preparation, and debrief. Olympic athletes and sports stars do this all the time. They actively visualize the outcome they desire. You need to see it first, and then you need to feel it. More importantly, you need to internalize it. Shouldn't we do the same thing? After the appointment, do a self-debrief. What did you do well? Give yourself a pat on the back. You deserve it. What would you do differently? For example, did you get an objection that you weren't prepared for? Or could you have answered it with more professionalism? If so, work on improving it so you do it better the next time. Develop the capacity to relive your successes. You know, I could do 99 out of 100 things correct, but if I mess up just one thing, what do I think about most of the time? Well, you guessed it, that one thing I screwed up. I believe that it's critically important to develop the capacity to relive your successes. One easy way to do this is to keep what I call a success journal. Every day, take some time to write down things you feel good about. Now, they don't have to be huge accomplishments. If you said that you wanted to make some phone calls from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. on Wednesday and you did it, then write it down as a POA or proud of accomplishment. You'll be amazed how well this idea works. Simply stated, success begets success. Be a student of the business. School is never out for a professional. The late, great Tom Wolfe once said that knowing that you know that you know, confidence replaces fear. Become aware of your self-talk. Is it more negative than positive? I'd like to share a case study with you from my coaching practice. On the surface, John was the perfect advisor. He memorized his sales scripts and presentations and could deliver them perfectly. There was just one problem. He didn't have faith or confidence in himself. How did I determine this? I asked him to close me. I heard it in his voice immediately. He didn't speak with conviction. He didn't see the value in what he was presenting. He was also coming across as unsure and tentative with his remarks. His prospects were picking up his hesitation from his body language and his nonverbal communication. Even though he was saying the right things, he wasn't as effective as he could be. John began using some of the suggestions we discussed earlier, and he saw an almost immediate increase in both his confidence and sales. The next cluster is mastery of the sales process. It consists of the following four sales success factors has a results orientation, is adaptable, questions and listens effectively, applies targeted problem solving. I've selected has a results orientation for this program because mastering this success factor can have a dramatic impact on your sales success. Salespeople who lack this sales success factor don't take their goals seriously. They either don't write them down, or if they do write down annual goals, let's say in December or January, then they don't look at them again until the following January. Oftentimes, if they do write down their goals, they're very vague and hard to track. What I see all the time is what I call too many what's and not enough how's. For example, an advisor might tell me that they want to earn $120,000 in commissions this year. I ask them how they plan on doing it. They tell me that they intend to write $10,000 of commissions per month. That's not a how, it's another what. They follow the path of least resistance. They often get themselves into what I call a success rut. The business could be better, but it's okay for now. Why rock the boat? These people don't keep records. They don't want to keep score. Doing so may expose their weaknesses. They have issues with accountability. You know, no one really likes to be held accountable for results, but people who lack this success factor avoid accountability at all costs. They don't seek out advice. 
it might require them to change the way they're doing business or to get outside of their comfort zone. Well, here are some suggestions on what you can do to improve your own results orientation. Write out your goals. Yes, I mean write them out and make them clear and as specific as possible. The very act of writing them out will actually increase your chances of achieving them. Make them measurable. If you can't measure or track your progress towards your goals, it'll be difficult, if not impossible, to make those course corrections we spoke about earlier. Review them often. And by the way, daily is not too often. Develop a sense of urgency. It's not only good for you, but it's good for your clients as well. A great way to put this in focus is the concept of periodization. It works like this. You take your annual goals, divide them by four. Each quarter then becomes a year in and of itself. So in our 12-month goal, at the end of the first quarter, we might be a little bit behind. And we say to ourselves, you know, I'm only three months into the year. I have nine months to catch up. No big deal. At the end of June, you're still behind, maybe not as badly, but you say to yourself, you know, the year's only half over. I still have six more months. The third quarter comes along, you're still behind, and it isn't until the fourth quarter that you say, you know, I better really get this into gear. Well, periodization says in the first quarter we have 16 weeks to hit our goal. If in week three out of a 16-week year, so to speak, you are behind, you get that sense of urgency to move forward. And by keeping on track in each quarter that way, you will not only reach your goals more easily, more times than not, you will actually exceed them. You should also reward yourself for progress along the way. Set benchmarks and interim targets. The more interim targets, the better. Frequent positive reinforcement is a critical component of success. Waiting three or four months to get feedback and to check your progress is, in my opinion, a demotivator. Be accountable. Share your goals. Get an accountability partner. Hire a coach. You will accelerate your progress if you do. Do a gap analysis. We talk about this in the NAFA sales system course. Draw two parallel lines on a piece of paper about two, three inches apart. On the bottom line, write down the words current situation. On the top line, write the words ideal situation or goal. The space between those two lines is the gap. Write out what are the consequences of not closing the gap. Be as clear and precise as you can. Next, write out what are the rewards for closing the gap. Be as specific and brutally honest with yourself as possible. I'd like to share another case study with you. Celeste set goals for herself, but they were more intellectual goals. We did a gap analysis and really focused on both the consequences for not closing that gap and the rewards for closing it. Once she was able to connect an emotional level to her goals, she became much more motivated and focused on achieving them. It was no longer just an intellectual exercise. Highest and best use of your time. As you go through the day or the week or the month or the quarter, you should be continuously asking yourself this question. What is the highest and best use of my time right now if I am to achieve my goals and perform at the level that I know I am capable of performing? The next cluster is mastery of customer relationships. This cluster contains three sales success factors. They are focuses on customer success, has interpersonal sensitivity, and gains commitment. I've selected gains commitment as the success factor from this cluster. People who lack this factor have difficulty defending a good idea when challenged. They're usually surprised when they get an objection or anything that they perceive to be pushback from their clients. As a general rule, they are generally not adequately prepared for the interview. They're unable to effectively show prospects the advantages and benefits to their recommendations. These advisors typically are more product salespeople and talk more about the features of the product than they do about how the solution 
will help satisfy client needs and objectives. These folks have difficulty closing sales. So what can you do to improve in this most critical area? Well, here are some suggestions. Pre-post-call preparation and debrief. Yes, we mentioned this again, it's that important. You may have noticed that this idea keeps coming up. I can't stress enough the importance of being prepared. This means that you have to see the world through the eyes of your prospect or client. We believe that doing pre-post-call prep and debrief, that your sales can actually increase by 15% if it's the only thing you do. Sell yourself first. Remember that your clients are first buying you. Develop a strong relationship first. Become that trusted advisor and your closing ratios will improve. Be honest with your prospects and clients. If you can't help them or don't have the answer right then, just say so. Most people appreciate that kind of honesty and you'll be rewarded for it. It's not about you, it's about them. We've all heard of the WIFM, W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me. Always speak in terms of how your solution will benefit them, your clients. Tie features to benefits and benefits to wants and needs and goals. Now, we used to say that it only took six magic words to turn features into benefits. And those words are, and what this means to you is. That's not enough anymore. You must continue and say, and that's important because it ties into your objectives to do X, Y, and Z. Talk less, listen more. If you're talking any more than 20% during the fact-gathering interview, you are talking way too much. Your fact-finding process shouldn't sound like an interrogation. I tell my coaching clients that when you are gathering information, relax, navigate with curiosity. Remember, it's another human being on the other side of the table. Ask trial closing questions. Test the waters before you ask for the sale. Ask open-ended opinion questions to see where your prospect head is at. You'll get the sense of how committed they are to your solution, or whether or not they truly understand what you have proposed. You know, it's been said that you don't sell in the close, rather you close after you've sold. They say that the sale is actually made during the fact-finding process. The close should actually be the easiest part of the sale because it's the logical conclusion to the sales process. Match your prospect style. You know, each of us prefers to interact with others in a particular way. In the NAFA sales system course, we state that there are four behavior styles, and they're labeled as talker, doer, controller, and supporter. Most of us are actually a combination of two of these styles. The more that you can present your ideas that match your prospect's style, the more open and receptive they will be to you and your ideas. Let me give you a story, a personal story, where that wasn't the case. When I was new in the business, I went out on a sales call and I met someone who was a controller. I was the more friendly, affable type of salesperson. I sat down with him looking around their office, trying to find some commonality and do a little chit-chat. My controller prospect sat there with his arms crossed, crossed his chest and said, what do you got? Well, I came to the only logical conclusion that was possible. This person didn't like me. I didn't like that, so what did I do? I tried harder. How did I try harder? I tried harder using my style. What did that do to my controller? It drove them absolutely crazy. So the more you can connect with people in their own style, and this is pretty obvious just by observing how they act and respond to you, the better. Another thing you could do is form a study group. Connect with others who want to improve in this sales success factor. Share ideas. Compare success stories. Learn from each other. Be open to new ideas and new methods. Now, the final cluster is mastery of own business. The four sales success factors in this cluster are has entrepreneurial drive, 
uses key information effectively, increases customer value, and builds a team. In part one, we spoke about building a team. This time, I've selected entrepreneurial drive. Now, Webster defines entrepreneur as one who organizes, operates, and assumes the risk in a business venture in expectation of gaining the profit. Entrepreneurial drive is much more than that. We believe that those who possess entrepreneurial drive take pride in being a sales professional. You'd actually be surprised to know how many salespeople, both new and tenured, have trouble with that label. They thrive on challenge and seek out opportunities that require some risk-taking and inventiveness to achieve a worthwhile goal. You never get it all done. They are always looking farther down the road from where they are now and striving to get there. They focus their energy on continuous personal improvement and they take initiative in finding creative solutions to their clients' needs and new ways of doing business. But be careful here. I'm not suggesting that you abandon proven success strategies. For example, you wouldn't want your surgeon who's about to perform an appendectomy on you to say, you know, I'm tired of doing this procedure the same old way every single time. I think I might try something new today. Salespeople who lack this sales success factor show no commitment to their sales career. They do the minimum to get by. As I mentioned before with Celeste, these producers have made just an intellectual decision versus an emotional one. Let me give you an example of this exact case in point that happened to me. When I, again, was new in the business, I noticed that all the successful producers in my office had their clients come into the office. I thought this was a great idea. So I started to ask my clients to come into the office. And I'm proud to say I had a 100% perfect record. Nobody did. And it went on like that. I never quite understood it. Until August of that particular year, my wife gave birth to our first daughter. And I noticed that working late at night, I was getting home after our daughter went to bed, and I did not get a chance to interact with her. That got me aggravated. I made the determination at that point that I was going to get home earlier, and the way I figured out I could do that is have more people come into my office. Now, I'll swear to you that I asked people exactly the same way as I asked them before to come into my office. However, this time, they started to say yes. You see, I made an emotional connection to an intellectual decision, and that makes all the difference in the world. These people go through motions without passion or enthusiasm. Did you just make an intellectual decision or a passionate one? The next factor that salespeople lack is need to have goals set for them, and then they don't believe that those goals are possible for them to achieve. They stay in the same rut. They believe that most everything is outside of their control to change or to improve. And it's always those outside influences that get in the way or are to blame. So what can you do to increase your entrepreneurial drive? Here are some suggestions. Create or review your personal mission and vision statements. Having a strong sense of purpose will propel you forward. What got you out of bed today? Was it the alarm clock or a passion to achieve and be part of something greater than yourself? Are you giving 100%? If not, determine why. What's holding you back? Is it real or just an excuse or a rationalization? Be brutally honest with yourself. Examine whether or not your actions are in harmony with your values and beliefs. Referencing the NAFA sales system course again, we state that there are five factors that must be in congruence or harmony in order to achieve at high levels. These factors are view of selling, view of abilities, values, commitment to activities, and belief in product. If any gaps or conflicts exist between one or more of these dimensions, your productivity and success will be sluggish. Let me give you an example. Being in congruence is like being in a car with your foot on the accelerator going 100 miles per hour from point A to point B. But if there's a conflict between one or more of these dimensions, 
say for example, commitment to activities and your view of selling, it's like having a foot on the gas and a foot on the brake. It doesn't mean that you won't reach your goals, but it'll take you longer to get there. Sometimes you might even wear out the brakes and need to stop and get them repaired along the way. Another way you can improve your entrepreneurial drive is to associate with others who have high entrepreneurial drive and then learn from them. You'd be surprised how many producers never take the time to observe successful colleagues and learn from them. Another way to learn from others is to read biographies of successful entrepreneurs and apply their lessons to your situation. You can create or form a mastermind group with like-minded advisors and let the group inspire you and pull you forward. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today, and I'd like to summarize by stating the six critical prerequisites to achieving success in sales, as I did in the last program, and then add six additional ones for you to consider. To review, the first six are an unwavering commitment to a sales career mission that is in line with your personal values. Success in sales requires much more than application of mechanical techniques. It demands a deep inner belief that you are part of something bigger than yourself and that you are contributing value of something great. A vision that provides a detailed mental picture of the future you want to create for your sales career as you pursue your mission. Walt Disney is often quoted as saying, if you can dream it, you can do it. I agree with him. Clearly define goals in which you specify what you need to achieve to make your vision a reality. Of course, mastery of these sales success factors and the behaviors, motives, attitudes, traits, and self-concepts that contribute to superior sales performance. Mastery comes with practice, dedication to lifelong learning, and a drive for continuous improvement. Just being good enough or possessing average skills won't cut it in today's super competitive, ever-changing marketplace. The sales profession demands excellence. Settle for nothing less. Create action plans that provide roadmaps. The vision and mission statements are the what, while action plans are the how. Your action plans don't need to be long or elaborate. Simple bullet points will do. Whatever form they take, be sure that they include actionable, measurable steps, each of which has a target deadline date. And finally, a way to maintain progress on your journey until the vision of your success becomes a reality. It's imperative that you find a way to keep score. Anything that gets measured can be improved. Tracking your progress along the way is critical to reaching your destination with a minimum of wrong turns and with maximum efficiency and effectiveness. Let me share an example with you. Let's say you were to go bowling, but there was a curtain hung midway down the alley. You could see the ball only until it went under the curtain. You could hear the pins fall, but you couldn't see which ones or how many fell. How could you ever hope to improve your score if you couldn't keep score? In addition to these six prerequisites, there are six more steps to keep in mind if you want to continuously improve. These six steps are review, clarify your mission. Analyze your current situation in terms of your mission. Set long and short range objectives. Create or schedule activities to achieve those objectives. Implement those activities. And then evaluate the results and repeat the cycle. Well, thank you for taking the time to invest in yourself and your practice by participating in this program. I would like to make available to NAFA members a free PDF of my book, What Every Great Salesperson Knows, A No-Nonsense Guide to Sales Success, upon which this program is based. Just go to www.insurancecoachu.com forward slash free book to sign up. And for those of you who are serious about looking into starting a coaching relationship, I'd like to offer to you a free 45-minute coaching session. Just go to my website, 
www.insurancecoachu.com and fill out the form to request a free coaching session. Well, thanks again for participating and good luck to you on your journey to success. Thank you for participating in this program. For more information regarding products, programs, services, and other NAFA member benefits, visit www.nafa.org.